Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming, Your Excellencies, uh, colleagues and friends. It's a pleasure uh, to have you at our annual Chatham House Iraq Initiative Conference. Um, thank you for being here. We're very much looking forward to the next day and a half uh, of, of conversation. A few notes before we begin. Uh, introduce the conference overall, so I'll, I'll do that introduction in a bit. Uh, there is translation between English and Arabic. If you need it to pick number two for Arabic and number three uh, for English. If someone needs to write a translation, it's number two for the Arabic and three for the English. Uh, the conference is all being held on the record, so not the Chatham House rule, although we are at Chatham House, uh, and it will be streamed online. Um, if, 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 if you'd like to tweet, please do tweet using the hashtag Iraq Initiative, uh, and, and please do ask questions. We have people joining online as well as uh, in person through the chat function uh, when the Q&A uh, begins. Um, so before I introduce the panel, I a few sort of welcoming remarks and sort of to give an idea of the Iraq initiative. So every year we gather here at Chatham House uh, as part of the initiative to kind of look back on the past year and what has happened in Iraq. Uh, and this year, obviously, not much has happened in the last year uh, in Iraq, so there's not much to discuss. Um, OK, great. I made the joke, people laughed, so it's more comfortable now. Um, so, you, you know, obviously, we had the elections. We had a winner, we had a protest, and somehow in between they reversed roles, and now you have another winner and others protesting. So we're here to try and make sense of the political, economic, security, social trajectory of, 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 the, of the country. What we've seen in the last year uh, is violence after election, more than, than, than usual, fragmentation, a unwillingness for consensus in, in a way more than usual, um, leading some, some to even the usual people calling for civil war and all of this, uh, but we haven't seen that. But we've seen the system really on the brink and this word on the brink has been used. But at the same time, it's come back and we're sat here one year later and like we always say at this conference, there is a certain resiliency to the system. There's a prime minister, there's a government that seems to be moving forward in the short term. Our role in the Iraq initiative is, is to look at the short term, but also to understand some of the medium and longer term trajectories to this. So although there is now a new government, although things seem to be moving ahead, where are we on the bigger social, socioeconomic problems? Where are we on the bigger issues? And if you look at the, the panels today, we're really trying to look at not just the short term, but the medium and long term implications of the demographics, youth, gender, and obviously the elephant in the room always corruption. Um, and, and so that is the role and of, of the Iraq initiative to, to look at state building, not just when it's sort of in, in crisis, but when it's in crisis every day for Iraqi in conflict every day we see for Iraqis, whether it's in the healthcare sector, as some of us saw yesterday, uh, or, or any other sector. Um, so without further ado, and, and thank you to Crescent Petroleum and UCL and Suedis for their support of the initiative, which allows us to, to really do the research that we've done, looking at issues like politically sanctioned corruption, doing deep dive into some of the movements, uh, the Sadris movement and other movements uh, surveys and, and our work will be available uh, for everyone. Okay, that's enough. Otherwise, Toby will tell me I'm speaking for, for, for too long. So I'll get to the, the panel now to introduce the speakers on the panel. Uh, very, very delighted to have this in sort of in the beginning to kind of give a broader view of where we are politically uh, in, in Iraq. Um, beginning with uh, Dr. Dial Asadi, who was an Iraqi politician and academic uh, and was head of the al Ahrar parliament between 2014 and 2018. Uh, sadly, uh, Dr. Abbas Al-Amri, who is joining us on, on Zoom, got his visa today. And sadly, the planes aren't fast enough to, to, to transport him in time for this. So we missed him by a day, but we're very delighted to have him join. Thank you to technology online. Uh, Abbas al Amri is a senior political advisor in the Iraqi parliament. He's also the secretary general of the Shia coordination framework and the state administration coalition, Idarat Dola, which recently has formed the government. 
Uh, then we have Marcin, Dr. Marcin Shamari, who is a research fellow at the Middle East Initiative at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs with the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, and she is working on her book project, A Century of the Iraqi Hausa, How Clerics Shaped Protest and Politics in Modern Day Iraq. And last but not least, someone very familiar to, to, to this room and to Iraqi politics over the year, Professor Toby Dodge, is professor uh, in the Department of International Relations, where he is deputy head of the department, PhD in research, and also the Kuwait professor and director of the Kuwait program at the Middle East Center. So the way we'll do this uh, is I'll ask an initial question and each of the participants will have five minutes to give their perspective on this. It's, it's sort of where, where they see Iraq, what their work is, what their job is on Iraq, and then we'll have a conversation online and in person. So my first question is to Dr. Abbas. Dr. Abbas, as part of the coordination framework as a secretary general, um, we now finally have a new government it seems like things are moving forward after one year of political stalemate. Does the new, how do you see the prospects of this government? Is the, has there been a resolution to Iraq's political paralysis from this government? Or how do you view the political fragmentation uh, today from your perspective? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shukran jazeelan lakum. كل الترحاب بالزملاء استاذنا الدكتور ضياء الاسدي والدكتور مرسين والسيد توبي دوج وشكرا لك استاذ ريناد ولتشاتم هاوس على هذه الدعوه الكريمه لم نوفق بصراحه للتحاق بكم لاسباب اللي ذكرتها ما يتعلق بتشكيل الحكومه هنالك ثلاث مسارات استراتيجيه ينبغي العمل عليها كما هو مخطط لذلك في الاطار التنسيقي وائتلاف اداره الدوله المسار الأول هو ترك الحكومة مفتوحة اليد ومختارة وبكل حرية أن تذهب لتطبيق المنهاج الوزاري ويرافق ذلك حزمة من التشريعات التي يحتاجها أو الممكنات لتنفيذ هذا البرنامج الحكومي أو المنهاج الوزاري والذي يتصدره مكافحة الفساد تتصدره مكافحة الفساد والخدمة المجتمعية في قطاعات الصحة والكهرباء والخدمات وهذا تقريبا يحدث لأول مرة أن يعني تلخص الحكومة مهامها وأدوارها في قطاعات خاصة وتذهب مباشرة لها ببرنامج مفصل هذا المسار الأول الذي ينبغي أن يحقق في ثلاث استيبات أو مراحل المئة يوم وبعدها ستة أشهر ثم السنه او عمر الحكومه الذي يعني يعطي لها البرلمان قبل ان يحل نفسه بانتخابات مبكره حسب اتفاق القوى السياسيه ربما يحدث ذلك بعد سنه ونص او سنتين او ما يعني تخبئه الاحداث او سلوك الحكومه فالحكومه بيدها هي من تطيل هذا العمر اذا كانت سائرة بشكل صحيح في تنفيذ برنامجها الحكومي والمنهاج الوزاري وفي القطاعات الخدمية المسار الثاني هو مسار الاندماج خلينا أسميه الاندماج الوطني الشامل في العمل السياسي وأعني به الاقتراب كثيرا من الأخوة في الكتلة الصدرية وربما بعض الأطراف التي أعلنت عدم المشاركة في الحكومة بدون أن تكون معارضة ربما أن يكون أكثر اندماجا أيضا في هذا الموضوع لنصل إلى نتيجة هو صحيح الانسداد السياسي قد حل وانتهى بعد تشكيل الحكومة أو إثناء تشكيل الحكومة ولكن ما يلحق ذلك هو الاندماج السياسي الأوسع بعودة الطرف الأهم في الساحة الشيعية في وهو الأخوة في التيار الصدري إلى الممارسة السياسية مرة أخرى المسار الثالث هو بصراحة أن يكون هنالك فك لثنائية الطبقة الحاكمة والطبقة المحتجة والتي تسبب فيها نقص الخدمات وهو الكبيرة بين الطبقة السياسية والطبقة الشعبية وهو تراكم بدأ منذ سنوات عديدة ربما تكون أطرافه ممتدة ومبتدئة 
منذ زمن النظام السابق لم يعالجها النظام الحالي لعده اسباب ليس الان المحل في خوضها لهذه الدقائق ربما في الاسئله سوف نضيء عليها اكثر فهذا المسار هو مهم جدا وايضا يتبع السلوك السياسي للحكومه وللائتلاف الحاكم بين قوسين وبخصوص الاطار التنسيقي وثم بمرحله ثانيه الائتلاف الائتلاف اداره الدوله وهذه الممارسات على المستوى الاداء السياسي الذي يغيب عنه ربما لاول مره التدافع الغير مبرر بين القوى السياسيه المشتركه وثنائيه ان يكون نفس الطرف مشارك في الحكومه ومعارض لها الان اندماج واضح طرف يعارض للحكومه وينتظر ويتركب كتنافس سياسي ثم والطرف اخر يرفع رايه الاداء الحكومي ويشترك بكل قوته والناس تنتظر ان لا يكون هذا التنافس مره اخرى والمسار الاهم هو المسار تطبيق المنهج الوزاري والذهاب الى ما اعلنت عنه الحكومه من انها حكومه خدمه وطنيه واما المفرد الثاني وهي ما يتعلق بالتنافس يعني السياسي بين سواء الاطراف الموجوده او الاطراف الغائبه عن الفعل السياسي الان فهو لا يخرج يعني من كونه تنافس بين هذه القوى وهي الحاله الصحيه في العمل السياسي. شكرا شكرا دكتور عباس. Um, if we can now uh, move to uh, دكتور ضياء. Abbas uh, talked about the government, its agenda, moving forward um, with the reform program. But there's a crucial sort of missing part, it seems, to, to this government. Uh, a few months ago, the Sadrists decided to withdraw from parliament uh, and, and, and potentially withdraw from the kind of political process. Um, how can we make sense of, of that decision? but also the role of the Sadrists in the political process uh, moving forward um, this year. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chatham House. Thank you, Dr. Renard, colleagues. And uh, it's a great honor to be with you today. Talking about the uh, last decision taken by the Sadrist uh, movement uh, with the drawing from the parliament, uh, actually it has a history. And the, the, the background for this is that there was a proposal proposed by Sayyid Muqtada Sadr himself, uh, it goes back to 2012, that this current political process is not going to produce or not going to perform in an appropriate manner because it has been built on uh, dysfunctional or built on uh, uh, unproductive uh, principles. Chief among these principles is the quota system, the muhasas. And all the political parties, all the leaders who are leading the government now, uh, in one way or another, have confessed that they couldn't really change or they couldn't solve this problem. And they have confessed that they, uh, the successive governments were a failure. They couldn't uh, achieve, uh, achieve the, the uh, promises they have uh, stated for their uh, voters. They couldn't meet the challenges. So they need to change. And, and these statements were issued by all the political leaders. And they said the solution for such a problem could be a, a majority government, a national majority government. And they also said that uh, we need to introduce a new blood to the political process, a new qualified people, not politicians, not partisans, not people who are affiliated with political parties who will be protected by their parties if they, if they fail. So Sayyid Muqtada Sadr took all these statements and confessions and turned them into a program. And in this program, he also uh, insisted on changing the political process into a more productive one, namely the national majority government. So when the Sadrist movement won the majority of seats, 73 seats, they decided to form the government on this basis. And they said that the first thing we are going to do is to eradicate this quota system, to change the quota system. Because this very system, this very principle, deepened the sectarian and the ethnic uh, divisions in the Iraqi society. So long as the government is, is based on these divisions, then keeping them rolling is going to deepen the differences and the uh, controversies, whatever, between the components of the Iraqi society. So we need to change this principle. When he proposed a national majority government, 
uh, ironically, he was faced by the same people who were claiming or advocating the national majority government. Also, they were calling for a presidential system, which is a bolder uh, step forward to change the whole system. And that was not Said Muqtada Sadr who wanted to change into a presidential system. He said that the system should be changed in a way that meets the expectations and the demands of the Iraqi people. But he said that the beginning, the first step forward is to have a cross-sectarian, cross-ethnic bloc. And this is what he has done. He wanted to make a coalition with the Sunnis, with the Kurds, so, uh, so as to start a new government, a government that is based on the bringing of all Iraqi components into government, but not necessarily based on political affiliations. The problem with political affiliations is that every political party provide their followers with the protection. They cannot be got into accountability. The judiciary system is uh, incapable of holding those people into accountability because they are protected by their parties and by their political leaders. And that was very clear to Sayyid Muqtada Sadr, especially in the executive branch. The legislative branch is open to all parties to participate in, to be part of. And they can perform either as uh, you know, the majority government or the uh, opposition part of the government. But in the executive branch, there should be uh, some power gained by being uh, independent to a certain degree and professional and qualified and uh, being also hold, uh, held into accountability if the given uh, minister or official fails to meet the expectations or to achieve the promises they have already stated. So that was the main purpose of the national majority government proposed by Sayyid Muqtada Sadr after winning the elections. And uh, everybody knows that uh, there was um, you know, uh, resistance to this kind of government because clearly it threatens the existence of certain political parties and leaders. And it posed certain existential problems for, for these parties. These parties that relied heavily on such divisions, on such uh, you know, differences between the uh, Iraqi components. These parties that uh, profited from the, uh, you know, the, the quota or the proportionate government, these parties that benefited from the whole situation since 2003, it would be very difficult for them to give away all these gains and to start a new phase of political practice that is unknown to most of them, that is really uh, challenging to everybody. So <clears throat> that was the step taken by Said Muqtada Sadr. Whether or not he is going to keep the same position, I think uh, it is very clear his not being part of this government is an indicator that he doesn't want to be part of, of such process. He doesn't want to be part of the same problems that uh, people were suffering from, that people were complaining from, including the current political leaders. Uh, what is he planning for? I think uh, the principles were clearly stated, well, I mean, uh, several times after the winning of the elections and then on different occasions that he wants to uh, establish an Iraqi government that is not uh, linked to any regional or international power, a supreme Iraqi government uh, a sovereign Iraqi government that can solve its problem starting from inside Iraq, not from outside Iraq. That is not uh, following the agenda of any neighboring or any international power. Uh, he knows very well that this is a big challenge. It is not an easy task to undertake, but he was capitalizing on the Iraqi people, including the Tashreen movement. And unfortunately, we have all seen that Tashreen movement was not uh, unified, they were divided among themselves. Uh, clearly, after some of their members won the elections, uh, the same leaders of the Tashreen movement condemned their positions and stated that they don't belong to the Tashreen movement because they did not represent their uh, demands and their slogans. Uh, Sayyid Muqtada Sadr was capitalizing on this popular and uh, this support, this kind of support that is given by people, but also uh, the, the long term, the strategic view for a new Iraq, uh, uh, the strategic view for a process that is different from the 2003 process from its consequences we are still suffering now.
Thank you, uh, Doctor. And certainly, it would be great to get back to the idea of maybe the question of opposition and what opposition may look like if if, if that is is the case. But first, to turn it over to uh, Doctor Marcin. Uh, Via is speaking about the Sudras really not thinking that this system, this political system on such bad foundations can be reformed. But now we now we have a new government which is claiming that it will try to reform and to try to listen to some of the demands of the street, demands of Tishreen and demands of, of protesters. How do you view this new government, its relationship to some of the bigger structural problems Will it be able to sort of uh, move forward on reform? Question, thank you. <laughs> it's an easy question for the morning. I mean, thank you for having <laughs> an easy question for the morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to Chatham House for hosting us. Um, I'll start by saying that when it term when it comes to reform, there's many ways to think about it. And you know, as anyone, I've lived in Iraq for the last two years, and as anyone who lives there realizes, there is uh, different levels of reform that the public would like to see. And I think every prime minister that comes in in Iraq has a more difficult time than the one previous to him, uh, simply because of the poor performance of the governance government over the years and the accumulated grievances of the Iraqi people. And so it becomes difficult, even more difficult with every time uh, to, to get the public galvanized behind a reform movement. So in the case of any prime minister seeking reform in Iraq, they will have to balance two things. The first is public support and public appetite for a particular type of reform. And the second is the um, counteracting pressures of the political elite against the reform. When it comes to the public support, uh, for the reform, it's really important for two reasons. The public holds any elite and any politician accountable in two ways. At the end of the day, Iraq still has elections. I know there's a lot of debate about the state of democratization, uh, backside into authoritarianism, all these things. But at the end of the day, we do have elections and politicians will care about their electability when the time comes for that. But even more than that, we have had lots of waves of mass protest movements, and those are also a tool of accountability that we have to be wary of and that politicians are wary of as well. So they'll have to seek out public reforms that mitigate these pressures that they'll sooner or later face. On the other hand, there's, of course, as you know, Renan said, the elephant in the room, corruption, the pressure is a political elite against particular types of reforms, and they'll have to be very selective about where they can maneuver. This is, of course, assuming the best intentions of a person seeking reform in a position of power, um, but we'll, we'll assume that. So uh, when it comes to do these two factors, you can think of different kinds of reform that we can see in Iraq. For example, you know, we're in London here, and I know that across Western capitals and across the international community, there's a very big appetite for security sector reform in Iraq. Amongst the civil society activists in Iraq, a lot of whom have been killed in protest movements, there's a lot of appetite for that as well. At the same time, it's not the highest um, demand uh, of the everyday Iraqi. And it's the one that will get a lot of pushback from different political sides. So it might not be the best um, direction that an elect that a new um, leader uh, can tackle. Another kind of reform that can happen in Iraq is public sector reform. And that's something that many people have written about, many people have talked of. Uh, former finance minister Ali Alawi has basically dedicated his entire point of service to this. Um, and this is really difficult because this is one of the sectors of reform where there is no public appetite because it goes against the short term interests of people and there is no political elite appetite because it goes against patronage networks. And so you have something that's very hard to accomplish either way. I think maybe one of the more manageable areas of, of reform would be something like a like a service sector reform. Uh, Iraqis' main grievances, when we're talking about the public, are about the bad services that they have to face, so poor education, poor health care, poor electricity, poor water. Um, and I think because of how much public support there is for reforming something in this capacity and the way in which that um, a leader can actually maneuver um, if they're focusing and tunnel visioning on one particular subset of reform, this one might be the not easy to accomplish, but the one that may be more likely to be accomplished than the others. Now, of course, this there's other aspects of being able to reform. We can say that Prime Minister Sudani currently has 
um, something that his predecessor lacked, which is some support in parliament. Um, but at the same time, even his predecessor, Kadami, who didn't have a political party, seemed beholden to political parties. So someone who is more closely tied to political parties like Sudani will have um, at least an equally difficult task in doing so. That being said, I don't think reform is impossible. I think with mounting pressures of everyday Iraqis, particularly with the very visible climate change, um, might galvanize political leadership to, to work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin. And uh, turning it over to continue the conversation you're having on reform, uh, maybe uh, to Toby. Um, we're having so far on the panel, we've heard sort of all sides. We've heard uh, a side that says that this government is pushing forward with a reform program. Marcin is saying that perhaps in the service sectors, there could be a, a way to, to, to pursue reform. But of course, others, Dia and, and, and other Sudras may, the Sudras, sorry, and uh, Dr. Dia may uh, think that um, reform in the system as it is doesn't work. So that's the kind of spectrum we're hearing so far. Where do you sit on that? What are the prospects for reform in this new government? Uh, and how does that sit into your reading of the resiliency of the system more generally? Okay, well, thanks. Firstly, like everyone else, I should uh, thank the Iraq Initiative for the invitation. But I also think, as we see with the crowded hall full of old friends and experts on Iraq, I think the Iraq, Iraq Initiative should be praised for putting this annual conference on the map each year and bringing such a rich group of analysts together. And it's a pleasure to be on the platform with Dr. Marcin, Dr. Deer, Dr. Abbas, all old friends. And let me uh, start off by disagreeing with all of them. So I can be, uh, I can be a, a, across the, across the uh, board. I think, and I celebrate Dr. Marcin's optimism, something on Iraq I admittedly haven't had for a long time, uh, limited and I think uh, constrained optimism. And I think, the point is, is central to what De Dr. Deer said, that the system itself constrains reform. As we, we've seen with the creation of the Sudani government, um, the apportioning, the, the pulling apart of the ministries, them awarding uh, as, as fiefdoms uh, to political parties, as we've seen since 2005, I think the resilience of this system is that it rewards, co-ops, and corrupts in equal measure. So uh, Marcin is exactly right to, uh, to, to highlight uh, security sector, uh, to service sector reform, electricity and water. But those of us sadly old enough to, to have been studying Iraq since 2003, remember repeatedly the energy, the hope of each government and the focus on electricity and water. And then the question becomes, why, if anything, is the electricity, the Ministry of Electricity even worse than it was? Because it's because it's such a cash cow, one of the largest budgets in, in the cabinet. It's been fought over and then recolonized by competing uh, parties. And with all due respect to my old friend, Dr. Deer, the Sudarists have been a central player in that, controlling in the previous government between a third and a half of the, of the national budget. So when we point at those demanding reform and those intriguingly absenting themselves, at least from the formal government, if not the informal and their domination of the commanding heights of the uh, civil service, we, th we then see it's revealed that the elite pact at the center of this government is both incredibly destructive. It, 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 if, if we see what government after government has failed to achieve, we can blame it quite straightforwardly on the system, the apportioning, the dividing of government, but also the corruption that gives direct rise to. So we celebrate uh, the, I would celebrate the appointment of Dr. Sudani, uh, 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 the, the breakthrough, but I would say what's left are a series of questions surrounding the resilience. There has been a major shift after Tishreen, where violence, as you were saying, Renad, has become a sense, once again, has become a central currency in the system. The violence uh, surrounding the election result when first declared in November, then the violence of the 29th of August, which ironically may have acted as a trigger for government formation. But overpinning all that, over, overshadowing all that, uh, Martin quite rightly says that mass protest acts as a pressure for reform, but those mass protesters paid a hell of a price. They were murdered, hunted down and murdered by arms of the state but also arms of the non-state. And I think when we look at the current government and those who've chosen not to be in it, both of which, there's clear evidence, were responsible for the suppression of the largest 
popular protest movement probably since the creation of Iraq and certainly since 2003. So violence has become a dominant currency in the system, which I think is very worrying. On top of that, uh, you have the, 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 the constant reduction of turnout, 36% of eligible voters in the last... Uh, in the last elections, what the population of Iraq seemed to be doing is withdrawing their support from the political system, either taking to the streets as the Tishreen movement where they face violence, or much more likely uh, lapsing into indifference. The system doesn't help them, it doesn't touch them, and they believe it cannot be reformed. And of course, overpinning all of this, overshadowing all of this, the corruption, the violence, the lack of public support, the lack of legitimacy of the system, is the corruption, the corruption that rewards the elite pack, that, that, uh, that, that, re, um, that diverts state resources into the financial, the economic offices of, each, of the major parties as a price for taking part. So I sadly can't share uh, Masin's optimism. I, 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 I think she's right to focus on uh, service sector reform, but I doubt uh, but, but I would, would uh, identify the lack of success in that, that service sector reform, especially electricity and water, have been the focus of every government since regime change. And yet still, outrageously, in a country so well endowed with oil, the population still aren't getting enough electricity or, or uh, um, enough water as a direct result of the corruption at the core of the uh, political system. Thanks. Thank you, Toby. Just waiting for the translation to, to, to finalize. Um, I encourage everyone to ask questions online or we're gonna begin uh, in, in person as well as people, I can start collecting some names. But before that, I wanna maybe go back to uh, Dr. Abbas, uh, having heard this conversation, uh, but also your role in, you know, as the Secretary General of the Coordination Framework, there's, there's basically a discussion on if it's the same political system, and many of the same faces, how can reform come about? Some reflections in a few minutes, if you will, based on the conversation we've had uh, so far. We don't hear. No, no, he, mute. الآن فتح الميكروفون. أي نعم. تفضل دكتور. شكرا جزيلا. الإصلاحات قطعا لا يعني لا تأتي بالشعارات. فالإصلاحات يفترض أن تكون عملية. استلام السلطة هو أداة من أهم أدوات تمكين الجهة التي تريد أن تقيم الإصلاح. فالعودة لاستلام السلطة والحكومة هو الممكن الأساسي لأداء الإصلاح الممارسات التي تقوم بها الحكومة الآن من إلغاء قرارات الحكومة تصرف الأعمال بدءا باختيار الوزراء الذين يركز عليهم دولة رئيس الوزراء على الملفات الخدمية خارج الحصص الحزبية وخصوصا الكهرباء والصحة والخدمات اختيار فنيين ومستشارين خارج هذه الحصص الحزبية لأنه يريد أن ينجح في هذه الملفات أعتقد هذه بداية موفقة للإصلاح واشتراك مع يعني من الجهة الكريمة التي كانت تنادي بالإصلاح وكانت تسعى لإستلام السلطة لتحقيق هذا الهدف السام الآن عندما شكل الائتلاف العابر للطائفية كما عبر الدكتور أستاذنا الدكتور ضياء وطبعا الأخوة عملوا بنصيحة سماحة السيد الصدر بأن الائتلاف لا بد أن يكون عابر للطائفية لذا شكل ائتلاف إدارة الدولة وهو إدارة الدولة وهذه دعوة يعني لجميع الأطراف العراقية وفي مقدمتها الأخوة في التيار الصدري للعودة لهذا يعني لإدارة الدولة عبر ائتلاف كان هم يعني يرحبون ويطلبونه وهو موضوع الـ الـ أن يكون عابرا للمكونات إذا صح التعبير ما يتعلق بالأصلاحات أعتقد أننا سوف نجد دعما جماهيريا إذا استمرت الحكومة بهذا هذا المنحة وقطعا الإصلاحات تبدأ في المناطق الفاسدة 
المناطق الفاسدة هي القطاعات الخدمية بالتحديد لذا عندما يرى الناس هنالك تحدي لهذه الأوكار والدبابير التي توغلت وتوحشت منذ زمن كبير سوف نجد يعني تكاملا شعبيا حكوميا وحتى نخبويا مع الأداء والسلوك الحكومة من أجل تحقيق الإصلاح الذي يطلبه من هو في السلطة ومن هو في المعارضة ومن هو صديق لنا من خارج أسواق العراق لذا أعتقد أن الإصلاح يبدأ من هذه المنطقة شكرا شكرا جزيلا um, دكتور ذيا Toby raised a, a point which you know this this concept of opposition uh, and and the Sadrist opposing um, the system and seeing it as as you mentioned as as, as a problem in itself but the Sadrist have been part of the system as well so maybe do you want to reflect yeah. or respond to to that point or any other points in the conversation well, thank you very much Dr. Renata actually this is the very point I wanted to, to discuss Great. that was raised by Toby and uh, Toby knows better than uh, many people that it is true the Sadrists were part of the successive governments but in all stages, in all different uh, points, uh, uh, Sayyid Muqtada Sadr issues different instructions to his ministers to withdraw from the government at a certain point. When Mr. Al-Maliki started to complain against the ministers in his cabinet and his in incapability or inability to perform because of the demands put by political parties, there were instructions issued by Sayyid Muqtada Sadr to all his ministers to resign and leave the cabinet for Mr. al-Maliki to choose the people who he can rely upon in order to achieve the objectives of his program. The same thing happened with Dr. Haidar al-Abadi and the same thing happened uh, in all different stages. Whenever there is a complaint by the prime minister or by the cabinet that because of the uh, distribution of portfolios along uh, parties and or whatever lines, the, the, the decisive uh, decision or or the decision taken by Sayyid Muqtada Sadr is that we have to step aside, we have to leave the government working so as to be held accountable. And that was the very answer to this question or to 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 the to this issue. And uh, and uh, uh, although the Sadr's were also part of the parliament, but they were part of a coalition. And in in uh, I think in 2010 they left the uh, the national coalition the Shia National Coalition, in order to seek a more cross-sectarian coalition, even in the parliament that was not just in the executive branch. They wanted to have coalitions along national lines, even in the parliament. So that was not considered or was not seen by, by observers as a credit to Sayyid Muqtada Sadr when he took certain uh, very hard decisions at that, at that time. Uh, for the distribution of ministries, with all respect to my colleague, Dr. Abbas al amiri I think even this government has also relied on the points, the, the system uh, of points that was used in the previous governments. So every party has certain points according to the number of seats in the parliament. And uh, in accordance with these points, the party gets uh, a, a, a portfolio or a ministry in the cabinet. So. Nothing has changed. And even those, uh, whether technocrats or whether qualified ministers uh, that were chosen by, by the prime minister, I think they belong to certain political parties. Or I, if not, they are part of the political party. At least they have certain agreements with the political parties that, that they have chosen them. Uh, and I have names. I can say these names. But everybody knows that the system has not changed. It's it's on the yeah, I mean. Uh, it, it is not something hidden. Everybody knows that all the ministers in this cabinet, if they are not directly belong to political parties, they have been brought by political parties after certain agreements. So, I mean, to be honest, in order to find solutions for the uh, chronic problems of Iraq, we are not actually dealing with the main malady, with the main problem. We are trying to deal with the symptoms and uh, Dealing with the symptoms or trying to fix the symptoms is not going to have any consequence. It's not going to bring about any change in, in the political process. Uh, we are paying blood. We are paying money. We are paying, paying all the you know uh, all the efforts that have been 
done in order to solve these problems without gaining any uh, any change. So we have to be clear, we have to be honest about this. Uh, without changing the system from inside, I'm not calling for a revolution, and it's very difficult in the Iraqi case to have a revolution and change everything radically. But to change the system from within, we have to change the principles. Uh, we have to change the very bases upon which the system was built. And the quota system or the apportionment system is one of these bases. And in order to change them, we have to take very courageous decisions. Uh, and this government has not yet taken any of these courageous decisions. Mm. Thank you. Dr. Marcin, I'm going to actually, there are a few questions uh, based on your comments online that I'm going to kind of put together to, to ask to you um, along the lines of the public appetite for reform uh, in, in the public sector. Um, as, as you said, strong from the young people. What can the government do to engage, listen, and respond to their concerns and demands? And there's a linked question to this, which is there seems to be um, some concern about some this question from Severi on militia groups, but other types of groups linked to the government um, and, and from the relationship between Tishreen activists and some of these groups. How do you see uh, the government managing these cast of characters? This question is almost asking me to prescribe a route for the government to follow in order to... to yes, yes I actually, it's good we have, we have a few people maybe who will be close to the government, which, uh, you, which may need your... Six which, months. <laughs> <laughs> solid answer on that. Um, yes, I would need six months to give a solid answer on that, but I can reflect a bit on you know some of the things we've talked about in, with regards to reform, and particularly use of security sector reform is uh, what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I think I'll preface all this by going back to what Toby was talking about with regards to my optimism, cautious optimism. I'd say that this really is not a result of my optimistic nature, but more a result of being Iraqi. And I see a lot of Iraqis in the room. And at the end of the day, I think given the choice between revolution and reform, we'd all prefer reform because we all know I don't think anyone wants to see their family have to live through a revolution when we see human history really showing us that revolutions are rarely successful and almost always bloody. So this isn't from my faith in an electoral system. It's not my, from my faith in a government, but it's really from the fact that I really would not like to see violence in Iraq. And I remember when violence almost happened um, in late August this year, from the outside, you know, a civil war in Iraq looked like an interesting phenomenon to be studied. But from the inside, it was disrupted schooling for a generation of kids who have already had disrupted schooling. It was, you know, potential deaths for people who had already lived through civil war through ISIS. And so it, we want to avoid it at all costs. And so that being said, reforms, some of them are so difficult to be almost impossible. And I think the issue with the security sector reform is that it, it's based on this idea that a state should have a monopoly on violence that everyone is suddenly talking about. It used to be only political scientists who defined a state this way. Now everyone um, is, is trying to define a state in this way. And I think perhaps Iraq is at a trans transition stage in which we can't achieve this monopoly on violence in the next you know, five years without risking mayhem and revolution and chaos and war. And this is you know, particularly sad because a lot of that has to do with seeking justice for some of the activists who were killed. But at this point, I think it's important to also try to prioritize what can be done just in order to ensure that the everyday life of, of Iraqis is as stable as it can possibly get. And so I don't have a, you know, a recommendation for how to achieve a monopoly on violence because from what I've seen you know, in human history, achieving that is, requires a lot of blood um, and so it may have to be put on pause to let more natural processes run their course. I think a country that has a higher standard of living, better education, uh, will naturally be reformist and will create a cadre of youth who are able to go on in the future and to enact those reforms from within. I don't think it is 
um, opt I don't think it's um, optimistic of me to say that that can happen because we have seen it happen. So, I mean, the Tishreen movement is very unwieldy. There's so many different actors, but at the end of the day, they did achieve an astounding success in parliament. And I think because of the events of the last year, we've forgotten that. And it's very detrimental to them because I think a lot of their possible constituents and their voters have forgotten that as well. But there is an appetite. Uh, there is debates over a vision for Iraq that are happening amongst Iraqi activists um, who would be more qualified to speak about their vision than I would. Um, and I think what we should do is focus on nurturing that, perhaps you know, not in the best environment, but in the best environment possible in a very difficult situation. So I hope that answers the, the questions. Thank from you. And we have a lot of questions, but uh, very briefly, Toby, um, Marcin, Dr. Marcin is saying revolution, you know, Iraqis don't want it, but they want reform. Very briefly, is there any way you see moving forward incre through incremental reform? Well, I completely agree with Marcin that there is a massive appetite. I think Tishreen and beyond Tishreen, the, the, the both active and passive support of a much wider section of society uh, demanding that the state be transformed is there. Um, I just think there's, of course, the, the dichotomy between revolution and reform is added to by the status quo. And I suspect yeah. um, if any of us were, were betting people, we'd be down the bookmakers putting a lot of money on status quo. because That's the most likely and what I was trying to get at. And it comes straight to the security sector reform is that we've I think Massey's right. I, I, I think the, the, the monopoly on violence is, is 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 not achievable. But also, I think at the heart of um, security and sector reform is a, is is a, a unstated dichotomy between state and society. And what this political system has done is is shred destroyed that dichotomy and brought those that wield coercion in society into the very uh, heights of the state, which makes security sector reform so difficult. So again, as, as Marcin said, I would focus on Tishreen. I, I think, uh, as Dr. Dio is saying, certainly you want a, a, an indigenous source for transformatory reform, but that indigenous support can be uh, encouraged uh, internationally, both in civil society and by states. And I think it's about time that the nature of the political system that Iraq has was called out, and who's to blame for it, certainly it was set up and imposed on the country under force of arms by America. And I think the international community has mm. an equal responsibility for the mess mm. that they left Thank behind. You. Thank you. So we'll now open up uh, the floor to questions. We have about 20 minutes uh, and lots of questions I see. So please do raise your hands and we'll begin first in here. We have microphones, I believe. Is there, if, if everyone could please uh, state their name, affiliation, uh, and Chatham House member is not an affiliation. <laughs> yes, right here. Victor. Thank you, Renad. Uh, Hassan Nadum, uh, former Minister of Culture. Uh, thank you, Renad, for putting all those colleagues, friends, uh, experts in Iraq together under the umbrella of Chatham House. Uh, I have direct questions for all panelists, particularly uh, to Dr. Dhea Lassadi. <clears throat> It's about the future strategy, actions, and uh, even way of thinking of Sadrist uh, after the creation of the government and after the end of majority government project, um, let's say even the system change. So uh, this is very, very important. Uh, to shape and reshape the success and failure of the current government. Apparently, Sadrists are very important, still influence everything in Iraq, uh, but without a presence in the parliament, but a huge influence in the public, how do you find this mm. you know, future, future actions or strategy? Thank you. Maybe just, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, shukran Jiran Hassan Janabi. وزير الموارد المائية السابق وسفير العراق في أكثر من بلد أنا أيضا سؤالي راح يكون إلى الدكتور ضياء بس أيضا الآخرين فيما يتعلق بالانسحابات الصدرية من الحكومات المتعاقبة 
وانا متعاطف كثيرا مع مواقف الصدريه حقيقه يعني تقترب كثيرا من يعني مشاعر الناس وحاجاتهم يعني بشكل خاص الفقراء والمهمشين انسحاباتهم لم تشكل بديلا للوضع القائم فبالتالي مو بالضروره هذا يسجل لصالح الحركه الصدريه لان يعني انت تنسحب المفروض تقدم بديل هذه قضيه القضيه الاخرى اللي حضرتك في تدخلك ايضا قلت انه الكوتا سيستم والمحاصصه يحمي الفاسدين ومشاكل الى اخره التحالف الذي طرح بعد الانتخابات الاخيره بين السيد الصدر والحلبوسي والبرزاني انا اعتقد كان سيوفر حمايات ربما اقل ولكن راح يوفر نفس الحمايات لربما الوزراء الفاسدين هذا التحالف لم يكن عباره يعني لم يكن الا عباره عن رغبه بكسر محاصصات سابقه تقليديه الناس يعني لم تترغب بها وبدليل انه كان تحالف هش ان الطرفين الاخرين تحقوا بحكومه اخرى ليست بالضروره على نفس المبادئ اللي كان اتفقوا بها مع الصدر. لماذا لا يكون تفكير استراتيجي بالمسألة هو تفكير حكومة ظل يعني هسه ربما أنا هذا التفكير ساذج ولكن لماذا لا تكون حكومة ظل بأسماء واضحة وببرنامج واضح ومن يلتحق بهذه أو تقسم هذه على مكونات معينة أنا ذاك راح يكون بديل حقيقي جاهز للحكومات القائمة شكرا 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 there is uh, over there in the yes I hope you can record all. Shemari, Rais, Moses, that's some of the shown at the Uliyah in Baghdad. So Ali, the Dr. Abbas Al-Amiri, to the government of the Prime Minister of Sudan, that is a limited experience in the foreign policy. So how can the government solve this problem? And how can the government للاطار التنسيقي اللي اليوم يمثل الـ الـ الشيعه في الحكومه الاغلبيه الشيعيه في الحكومه ان يحل مشكلته في التواصل مع المجتمع الدولي اللي سببت سابقا كثير من المشاكل شكرا جزيلا شكرا دكتور one question here here right here is there ah sorry you Okay, you have the you have the power. You have the microphone. <laughs> okay, I do. I I don't. Have, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Much. <laughs> uh, my name is Sian Chenery. I'm going to say it basically to Toby. Toby, I like you to comment on the legitimacy of the election. Mm. Let me put it in figures. People sitting in the parliament um, before the Sadris actually left it. They represented 16% of the total eligible voters. 16%, I repeat. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that number, the United Nations endorsed that and classified the election as a success. How can you rule a country with everyone sitting in parliament that's opposition and the like to be? representative of the people that can actually perform for the benefit of the people. Mm. Keep in mind, all the big parties found themselves losing 30% of their followers in the last election, ignoring the fact that there has been an increase in the population of a million people capable of being involved in the election. I'm very surprised that there hasn't been real outcry by Thank you. international community about the decision that mm. the uh, United Nations representative conveyed to the world that we have such fantastic Thank election. You. Thank you for the question. Thank, Thank you. you. We have uh, just two questions here, and if the microphone can somehow... Yes, now no, you have to give up your power. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, 
Yanar Mohammed, uh, Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq. Um, I have a few questions for the panelists. I would like to start with uh, a comment first, a first comment that uh, um, the power and opposition in Iraq is not between these two blocks that are in the government, as much as it's between the people who expressed their, their free will in Tushreen and between a government who are fighting among their seats in the government. Um, the Itar has reached to power and they are, uh, they are uh, suggesting uh, a group of reform, but they are not saying anything about getting the killers of the demonstrators to justice. 800 people killed by 800 people who were not armed, peaceful demonstrators were killed. And this uh, so-called legitimate government is not saying anything about getting the killers to justice. So the legitimacy of the government here is under question. And if their so-called uh, opposition uh, within the government, uh, the Tayyar, is the alternative by some people's opinion, uh, Iraqi people have a problem here that we had lived under Saddam Hussein for tens of years where one person ruled our destiny. Whatever he said, managed our life for the next day and the following day. Uh, in, in Baghdad, in the last month, when he said a word, there were, was, was fighting in the streets and bombing around the city. So when the destiny of millions of people mm. is uh, connected to the word of one man, we have a problem with that. Mm. And that is nothing close to, to democracy mm. in Iraq. Uh, I, I mean, I heard... Uh, Dr. Zia speaking about uh, reform and how it's changed from within. But reform has been given its time for so many rounds and it's not coming. And there are armies of militias that are thriving on it, on corruption. How can it be changed from within? No, no, not possible at all. Thank you. Um, one last elephant okay. in the room that nobody so doesn't elephants. seem to have noticed other than corruption, is that um, mass killings of women. There is not a day when four or five women are killed all over Iraq, other than other abuse for women. And this is still uh, supported by the laws, by the judiciary, by the police, and by the mental state, um, mental state of the tribals who are informally ruling Iraq. And the religious institution is quiet. So giving our destiny over to a government that has no plans of changing the laws for women. Um, when uh, Dr. Abbas spoke, there was no mention of laws for women or reform for women. So in my opinion, this is the big white elephant in the room. Thank you for Thank raising you. that. And we're lucky to have you and others on a panel uh, later on to discuss exactly that. Um, yes, just here, right? No. Dr. Bushma, she's in the white, in the white, the woman. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank تبنى على هذه الحكومة القادمة في مقابلها هناك تفاؤل وهناك تشاؤم في كل هذا طرحت مواضيع تتعلق بإصلاح القوات الأمنية أسأل هل من وجهة نظركم لو شرع قانون التجنيد الإلزامي أو ما يسمى بقانون خدمة العلم ممكن أن يكون هذا الطريق لهذا الإصلاح يعني على الأقل حتى نتخلص من تسمية القوات الطائفية أو التي تنتسب إلى طائفة معينة أو أو إلى آخره هذا راح يكون قوات تنتمي إلها كل طوائف الشعب وبالتالي قد نتخلص من هذه التهمة للقوات الأمنية في مقابلها أيضا أي إصلاح إحنا دا نفكر به هل إلى جدوى دون أن نقضي أولا على الفساد الفساد هو سبب كل هذا الخراب 
اصلحنا القوات الامنيه اصلحنا الكهرباء اصلحنا الماء وماذا بعد اذا كان هناك فساد سيقضي على كل خطوه نقوم بها ايضا تعزيز القوات الامنيه كيف سيكون هناك تعزيز للقوات الامنيه وهناك قوات عشائريه وقوات مسلحه اقوى من هذه القوات الامنيه بحيث يصلون الى حد الخوف من اي تحرك لالا يكون هناك تحرك عشائري بالضد من عندهم او تحرك للقوات المسلحه بالضد من عندهم شكرا, شكراً. We'll take two more questions. I'm really sorry, and then we have to come back. There's a question there and a question right here. He's been, he was the first actually to put his hand up. Thank apologize. you. Uh, okay, my name is Adai. Uh, I have some questions to um, uh, Dr. Lea. Uh, first, you mentioned that you want to form a government with the uh, Kurds and Sunnis, and Al Itar, they managed to do that themselves. Why don't you accept you failed and you go on to opposition, like be an effective opposition? And uh, you you participate in other like previous uh, successive governments. Um, some might say like you participated, you took your share and then you made noise and you quit. So what, what what's the difference that makes like, what, what, what have you done now? And to Toby, I have a question. <clears throat> It's about a uh, general question. Uh, before, like Iraq is a very rich country. It has a lot of natural resources, uh, but just that by corrupt political system. So before 2003, we used to have one Saddam. After 2003, we had like 11 Saddams with corruption. And they keep, go uh, keep going. And um, it seems like uh, when, uh, after ISIS, they became like 20. So how, what, what do you think uh, about how we can Get rid of them because elections just doesn't work these days. Thank you. Thank you. Final question, and then uh, you have a very few minutes to answer everything. But uh, one last, one last, one last, one last question here, and then our experts will come. Abdullah Al Qali from Crescent Petroleum. You allow me, Dr. Rinad. I would like to raise my questions in Arabic, so just make it easy for Dr. Abbas. Uh, Dr. Abbas Al Amri. خلال مطالعتنا المنهاج الوزارة الذي قدمه السيد محمد الشياع في الجلسة الأولى في البرلمان جلسة التصويت عليه وجدنا أنه يدعو إلى انتخابات مبكرة خلال سنة واحدة وكذلك دعا إلى إصلاحات كبيرة جدا منها إقرار قانون النفط والغاز إقرار قانون توزيع الثروات قانون الانتخابات وما إلى ذلك هل تعتقد أنه فعلا بالإمكان؟ الوصول الى نفس النتائج الذي دعا اليها هذا البرنامج وهو اقامه انتخابات خلال سنه واحده. سؤال ثاني الى الدكتور ضياء الاسدي وهو تعليق وسؤال في نفس الوقت ويسمح لي يعني بسعد صدري يعني على اليس من الاسهل على الاخوه في التيار الصدري الاعتراف بانهم اخطاوا في السنوات الماضيه بالدخول في تكتلات كانت تقوم اساسا على المحاصصه. عوضا عن ايجاد مبررات لا يتقبلها الكثيرون حقيقه، وذلك من اجل ان تكون لدعوتهم مصداقيه تحديدا لدى الوطنيين ولدى الشباب في العراق. شكرا جزيلا. شكرا جزيلا. We have I'm, I'm so sorry for the many questions, but hopefully over the break you can the speakers will be there to continue. But if we can now go back, each speaker has two minutes to answer all of the questions uh, and, and, and summarize. Uh, that would be great. Let's go in the order that we started. So we begin with uh, Dr. Abbas. Hello, Dr. صوت ماكو الميوت ما يتعلق ما يتعلق بجواب الدكتور محمد الشمري وهو السؤال الاساسي اللي ممكن نجيب عليه وهو ان العلاقات الدوليه للعراق كانت مبنيه على ثلاث اشياء الاول تقديرات خاطئه من قبل الدول الاخرى التي تريد يريد العراق ان ينفتح عليها او هي تريد ان تؤسس لعلاقات مع العراق وتقديرات خاطئه واحكام مسبقه ربما امتدت لحقبه ما قبل نظام 2003 وارادوا ان ان يحشروا علاقه جديده او يفرضوا علاقه جديده بطبيعه خاصه بهم وليس للعراق تصور خاص بها. القضيه الاخرى ان العلاقات التي اراد الاخرون عقدها مع العراق او العراق اراد ان يشكلها 
اصطدمت بعقبه الصراعات الدوليه والاقليميه على الساحه العراقيه والتي تعتبر مساحه يعني طاقه بالدرجه الاولى. الخطا او القضيه الثالثه هو خطا التقديرات الاستراتيجيه من قبل الفاعل السياسي العراقي الذي كان على راس منظومه او مؤسسه العلاقات الخارجيه سواء رئيس للوزراء او مسؤولا عن العلاقه الخارجيه. اختلطت هذه الاشياء الثلاثه وكونت علاقات مشوشه لم يكن لم تكن مستقره لذلك لم تحقق مصالح كان هنالك خلط كبير بين المصالح وما غيرها المصالح التي يراد ان تصمم على شكل البيئه الدوليه وهي المصالح المتبادله والمصالح التي كانت تفرض على العراق او الذي اراد العراق تحقيقها لمصلحته ولم يستطع الان تسميه مستشار شؤون العلاقات الخارجيه الدكتور فرهاد علاء الدين تصور رساله مهمه من من السيد رئيس الوزراء بانه يريد ان يطلع بشكل يعني حقيقي على مفردات تكوين علاقه خارجيه مستقره مبنيه على المصالح المتبادله وكذلك يريد العراق ان يستثمر ذلك من اجل استقراره اولا وتحقيق المصالح خصوصا مصالح اوروبا التي تنتهبها الحرب الاوكرانيه الروسيه وتبقي بظلالها عليه الان العراق يضع سيناريوهات للعلاقات وبمعزل طبعا تعرفون ان العراق الان يصطدم بمشكله التهديدات على حدوده من مجموعه من الدول المجاوره هذه ايضا يراد ان ان تصفر حتى كل شيء من بعد بعد هذه بعد تصوير هذه التهديدات علاقات مبنيه على اساس المصالح المشتركه. اما ما تفضلت به سيدة الفاضله ان العراق لم نجد هنالك تشريعات تخص المراه كل المنهاج الوزاري والسؤال السيد الاخير ايضا عن المنهاج الوزاري وكيف يتم الاصلاح فيه. هنالك لجنه من الخبراء تقام من دوله رئيس الوزراء بتشكيلها لمقابله المنهاج الوزاري بممكنات تشريعيه والان يوجد جرد لكل القوانين التي تسهل اقامه يعني تسهيل تنفيذ المنهاج الوزاري وهنالك تايم تيبل لاهم هذه القوانين والشيء الاخير الذي احب ان اضيفه ان هنالك لجنه برلمانيه حكوميه الحكوميه تراسها دوله رئيس الوزراء والنيابيه تراسها سياده رئيس مجلس النواب هي تقوم بمتابعه اسبوعيه تقدم تقريرا اسبوعيا عن مفردات تنفيذ المنهاج الحكومي خصوصا فيما يتعلق بالاستقرار الامني مكافحه الفساد اولا والاستقرار الامني ثانيا شكرا دكتور دكتور ضياء Thank you very much. Dr. Hassan Nadam uh, raised the question, the future and the strategy of the Sadr's movement. Actually, this question can only be addressed to Sayyid Muqtada Sadr because he's the leader of the Sadr's movement. And nobody is authorized now to talk on behalf of Sayyid Muqtada Sadr because the political commission and uh, you know all these offices were closed down. I'm not talking on behalf of the movement now, but I'm a member of this movement. So I can say that the future is based on the way the political formula is going to be drawn whether by the current political parties or by any players. He is more concerned about, uh, I mean, how the future can be achieved by a political system that meets the aspirations of people. And in his mind, the current political system will never meet the aspirations of people and will never face the challenges that the country is facing. Uh, there was just one question. And uh, the question of Dr. Hassan Janabi was in Arabic, so I'll address the question in Arabic. Uh, الانسحابات أملتها بعض القضايا حقيقة هناك جانب عادة ما يغفل uh, في التعاطي مع موقف سماحة السيد من العملية السياسية وهو أن السيد مقتدى الصدر فضلا عن كونه قائد عن كونه قائد uh, وزعيم اجتماعي وسياسي وزعيم ديني وهو ينظر إلى القضايا في أحيان كثيرة من وجهة نظر دينية بمعنى أنه يقيس القضايا يقيس الأمور وجوده في السلطة أو خروجه من السلطة تمليها عليه العقلية الدينية التي يفكر فيها أو عن طريقها أو بها في بعض الأحيان وكثير من الانسحابات جاءت على هذا الأساس واحدة من الانسحابات كانت بسبب عدم رضا المرجعية الدينية في النجف الأشرف عن العملية السياسية برمتها وعن الفاعلين السياسيين فوجد أنه من الصعب البقاء 
في عملية سياسية لا توفر لها المرجعية الدينية في النجف الأشرف أي غطاء شرعي ولا يريد أن يكون في هذا الموقف بمعنى أنه يشترك في عمل سياسي تكون المرجعية الدينية وهي الراعي الأول والأساسي للعمل السياسي في العراق غير راضية عنه ولذلك هذه الانسحابات تمليها بعض القضايا ومن الخطأ أن نعامل أو نتعاطى مع مواقف السيد مقتدى الصدر على أنه هو زعيم سياسي واجتماعي فقط هناك جانب آخر وهو كونه زعيم ديني والقرارات تؤخذ بناء على هذا الأساس التحالف التحالف الذي حصل بين السيد مقتدى الصدر والقوى السنية والقوى الكردية حقيقة كان الغرض منه هو كسر للأطر الموجودة التحالف اللي حصل الآن بين الإطار التنسيقي والسنة والكرد هو ليس كالتحالف الذي حصل بين السيد مقتدى الصدر والأخوة الآخرين لماذا؟ لأن التحالف الحاصل الحالي كان بين الشيعة كقوة واحدة أولا وجدت أولا وتوحدت أولا ثم ذهبت إلى الطرفين السني والشيعي ما أراده السيد مقتدى الصدر أن يكون التحالف بين الثلاثة كقوة واحدة وكان السعي هو لكسر الأطر والقوالب التي رسمت بعد 2003 بمعنى أن هذا هو التجسيد الحقيقي للتحالف العابر للطائفية والأثنية وهي محاولة ثانية كان قبلها التحالف مع الحزب الشيوعي والأحزاب المدنية والأحزاب العلمانية ودخل في قائمة سائرون في الدورة النيابية الماضية وكانت هذه المحاولة الأولى لكسر القوالب الطائفية والقومية التي أسست بعد 2003 ولذلك هذا التحالف يختلف جذريا وهو, سؤال وهو جواب أيضا للسؤال الذي أثاره الأستاذ ماذا يختلف تحالف السيد مقتدى الصدر ولماذا لا ندعم هذا التحالف طالما أن السيد مقتدى الصدر أيضا تحالف مع الكرد والسن لذلك أنا أقول أن تحالفه مع الكرد والسنة يختلف تماما في مفهومه وفي تطبيقه وفي إجراءاته عن التحالف الحالي Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, two minutes really quickly, and I will follow up with anyone personally if they have a question. So I'm going to hit three points, one which was not directed at me, but about the voting and the UN. Um, so Iraq adopt, adopts a voter uh, turnout rate of eligible, not eligible voters, but people who have registered, which actually a lot of other countries do. Uh, there is actually no threshold for what makes an election um, viable or legitimate technically. Of course, we can talk a lot about what does it mean that only you know 16% of people who can vote came out and vote, and that actually does say a lot. But I think one part of it that we should also reflect on is that the UN was specific about it being technically sound, but it also means that there's a huge base of people who are potential voters in the future. And it's much easier to mobilize non-voters to vote than it is to get people to change their political um, affiliations or allegiance. So it is an opportunity as much as it is does cast doubt on the legitimacy. Um, and I, I don't deny that there is a lot to think about when it comes to the legitimacy, but technically it's um, there is there is no base for this. Uh, no, sorry, no, um, no standard for what makes it uh, a government that can be formed or like a parliament that can function. Um, with regards to women, um, I mean, there's so much to say about this. We can talk one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I've been working on a report about women's political participation and the relation to civil society. I will say that the biggest hurdle for the women's movement in Iraq is the lack of allies that are powerful. Um, and Iraq has good basis for for supporting the women's movement historically, but it hasn't really been built on since, for decades. Um, and so we're lagging in that capacity. And then the last question about the draft um, and mandatory conscription, I think the biggest issue there is that it might create more corruption. So yeah. That's it for me. Fears. Yes. Very briefly, I'm standing between you and your coffee and some rather nice biscuits, I think. So um, just, I Thank think on, on Dr. Shalvi's uh, question, I mean, we wrestle with this. As Martin was saying, the, the voter participation is, 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 is being forced down as more and more people realise that voting, uh, that their votes aren't actually shaping the terrain upon which uh, politics is performed. And in this elite pack, this informal consociationalism, uh, the votes are about the apportioning of access to corruption broadly. Um, and so that's not a surprise that people are refusing in larger and larger numbers to take part. I wouldn't write Iraq off. I think Iraq is still a democracy. I think voting still counts. I think the outcome of elections is unpredictable. But the people who dominate the process, uh, the legacy of 2003 onwards, are fundamentally unqualified, unsuited. 
to deliver what the majority of the Iraqi population want. The you know, violence and corruption dominate a system that is still technically democratic. So I wouldn't dispose with the voting because I think that would increase the violence, not decrease it. And as Martin was saying in her, her original intervention, I think seeking to mobilize a population, seeking to take the wave of, of anger, but also mobilization that was the Tishreen movement and try and channel it into the system, I think is a positive step. I would add, someone mentioned the positivity of, of Tishreen in Parliament. If we see what happened to those parties that went into Parliament, they were uh, neutered, constrained by equal measure through co-optation and corruption and violence. So I think we're a long way away from a grassroots movement mobilising through the ballot box into Parliament to make a difference. I don't think those that did take part in the elections are, are making a difference. I think they've been very effectively targeted as key players in, in the, the, the previous government who were deemed to be a threat were also targeted. First, they come with violence, then they come with corruption. You can be dead or you can be very rich. Take your pick. Thank you. That's as close as we'll get, Professor, to a positive uh, ending from, from you. So we're very fortunate for that. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Abbas, Dr. Dia, Dr. Marcin, and Professor Toby Dodge, uh, and, and to all of you for your questions. Uh, I am to inform you that refreshments are served upstairs on the ground floor, uh, where I'm sure the conversation will continue, and the next panel will commence at 10.45. So thank you very much to the speakers.